a regime that's traded in the interests of its people, sacrificing them in return for Western money and handouts for the benefit of Zelensky and his inner circle. Under these circumstances, attempts of the leader of the Kiev regime to promote his formulae, to convene summits in support of the Kiev regime, provoke nothing but bafflement. Very soon, the only topic at any international meeting on Ukraine will be the unconditional surrender of the Kiev regime. I advise you all to prepare for this in advance. Thank you very much. This is my video update on this Friday afternoon, April the 12th. Let's talk about some news. And how about that Nebenzia, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, speaking at the UN Security Council, where he said very soon, the only topic of any international meetings on Ukraine will be the unconditional surrender of Ukraine. So I advise you all to prepare for that. What a statement from the Benzia, huh? He must know something. He absolutely must know something about where the conflict is, is going for him to make that kind of statement. And what he, was, uh, what he was talking about during his statement at the UN Security Council was the meeting that is going to take place, well, the event that is going to take place in Switzerland over the summer where they are going to discuss, a bunch of countries are going to discuss Alensky's Ukraine peace formula. And uh, the peace formula for Alensky calls for the Russian military to, to pull back. It calls for, for everything to go back to 1991 borders. And I believe the Alensky peace formula also calls on the Putin government to resign and for Putin to be sent to The Hague, something like that. That's the Alensky peace formula. Basically, it's uh, the capitulation of Russia, and that is what uh, they're going to discuss in Switzerland. At least that's my understanding of this Switzerland-Ukraine uh, peace summit, where the Swiss authorities, I don't think they've officially invited Russia to this event. Why would Russia go to this event if they were invited? But uh, I don't think they've been officially invited anyway. And, uh, and the Swiss authorities... They have said that this isn't really a peace event without Russia, but we're going to have this peace event, which is going to be talking about the Alensky peace formula. It's not really a peace event because Russia's not going to be there, even though Russia hasn't received an official invitation to event. And why would Russia go to this event, which is a delusional event, talking about their capitulation? Anyway, the whole thing is really weird really bizarre and that's what Nebenzia was talking about in his statement when he said that the only thing that the international community is going to be talking about when they have meetings is going to be the unconditional surrender of Ukraine and uh, and he said I advise you all the collective West I'm advising all of you guys to prepare for the unconditional surrender of Ukraine Nebenzia also said in his statement that residents of a number of Ukrainian cities, including Kharkiv, Odessa, Nikolaev, have begun sharing coordinates and information about the location of Ukrainian forces with Russia, demonstrating their position on the conflict. That's an interesting statement as well from the Russian ambassador to the United Nations. Now, Putin meeting with Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, he said this about the Switzerland event and i quote now as you know the idea of holding some kind of conference in switzerland is being promoted they don't invite us there moreover they think that we have nothing to do there at the same time they say that nothing can be solved without us and since we are not there let's go it's already a crazy house <laughs> yeah it's it's really weird <laughs> it really is weird this switzerland event it makes no sense uh, a crazy house, as, uh, as Putin describes it. But uh, Putin also said during this meeting with Lukashenko that the reason Russia 
is destroying Ukraine's energy infrastructure is because Alensky decided to launch drone strikes against Russian oil refineries. Now, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's the reason that Russia is taking apart Ukraine's energy infrastructure. But uh, that's what Putin said. Alensky provided Putin with the perfect excuse to, uh, to explain why the Russians are dismantling Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Well, it's because dumb, dumb Alensky decided to send drones into Russia and do these pinprick drone strikes on our, on our oil refineries, which really do not help Ukraine whatsoever when it comes to, to the actual conflict. But uh, that's what Alensky decided to do. And so, you know what? Now we're going to destroy Ukraine's energy infrastructure, which is what the Russian military is doing. But I believe the Russian military was going to destroy Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Um, this was part of the, the military strategy, part of the military plan. I don't know what what's going to happen once all the lights are out in uh, in various regions in Ukraine. This I don't know. I don't know what the overall military plan is, the military objective. But uh, what what Alensky did is that he provided Putin with with the perfect excuse. Dumb, dumb military strategist Alensky. He gave Putin the ultimate excuse to explain the the very heavy, very devastating Russian strikes on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. And uh, boy, boy, have the Russians really done a lot of damage to the electric grid, to the energy grid of Ukraine. I mean, they have, they have demolished it. They really have demolished it. Yesterday, they took apart a power plant in Kiev operated by Centrenergo. And this company was operating a major uh, power plant in Kiev, I believe the big supplier of electricity to not only Kiev, but also to surrounding regions. Russian missiles completely destroyed this uh, power plant. They also hit the energy infrastructure in, uh, in Sumy and Kharkov. Uh, evacuations in Kharkov, I believe they have started. So people are being evacuated from Kharkov. Uh, Bloomberg, they ran an article with the title, Russia Attacks Ukraine gas storage sites, driving prices higher, strikes highlight risk as firms mull keeping gas in Ukraine. Ukraine's facilities are linked to EU's gas networks. This is from Bloomberg. Did I not talk about this yesterday and a week ago? Alexander also highlighted this story from Bloomberg the other day. Alexander was talking about this also a week, a week and a half ago about how uh, how this region in West Ukraine, uh, Striyi region in West Ukraine, close to Lvov, had a huge gas storage facility where EU gas was being stored. And, and the Russians, for two years, they they did not hit this uh, gas storage facility. facility. What does that tell you? For two years, they said, no, nah, we're not going to hit this gas storage facility. And now they're, they're going after this facility. And Bloomberg is talking about how the Russians are going after this facility. Completely devastating Ukraine's uh, energy infrastructure. Completely destroying it. Um, and, and there's nothing Ukraine can do. They can't stop it. There's no air defense that Ukraine has to, to stop. Uh, the Russian uh, strikes. So Alensky, of course, he is in panic mode. And he said yesterday that Ukraine has to begin talks to enter the European Union in June. He is demanding that Ukraine begin talks to enter the European Union in June. He's, he's very worried. Alensky is is having a meltdown. He is absolutely panicking. He's also demanding that Ukraine enter NATO. He was meeting with with Duda and I believe the the prime minister or president of I want to say Lithuania, but I'm not sure. Anyway, he was he was in a meeting with these guys. Uh, Duda standing next to him. 
I don't think Duda gave him the big old hug. I don't think Duda, Duda was hugging Alensky this time. But uh, Alensky was like, you know, we have to get into NATO. We must get into NATO. We deserve, he said, we deserve to get into NATO. The guy is absolutely melting down. Alensky is panicking. Putin wants to destroy us, destroy Ukraine, and then conquer all of Russia's neighbors. There is simply no alternative to our security. Therefore, there are no real alternatives to inviting Ukraine to NATO. An invitation to the alliance is needed. All our people and soldiers deserve this. Things are not going well for Alensky. He also said the other day that there are Russian spies in the Ukraine military. Yeah, Zelensky's losing it. He is losing it. He said that there are spies in the Ukraine military. And, and that is how the Russians knew how to, uh, how to prepare so well for the 2023 spring super duper summer summer spring winter fall spring summer counteroffensive it's because according to Alensky in a statement the other day Russia has spies informants in the Ukraine military and that's how they knew uh, where where Ukraine was was going to attack during the Summer offensive. That's why they prepared so well. <laughs> oh, Ledsky, Ledsky. Eh, Podoliak. Eh, you know, I, I thinking the other day. Russia, Russia knew where we were going to attack in our super surprise offensive. They knew it. So I think maybe, maybe Podoliak we have spies, Russian spies in military, uh, but Mr. President, uh, maybe, just maybe, the Russians knew in which direction you were going to, to attack because maybe, Mr. President, you were talking about it nonstop for the, for, for the previous six months leading up to, to the start of the offensive. Maybe, just maybe, Mr. President, that's how the Russians knew where to, where to prepare. Their fortifications? <sighs> Maybe no. No, Podoliak. This, this isn't it. This isn't it. Russia, Russia had spies. I know they had spies in military. <laughs> Not only did Alensky talk about the super duper counteroffensive nonstop every day for six months leading up to the counteroffensive. So did Kirby. So did Ursula. So did Burrell. So did. Uh, so did Duda, so did um, Michelle, so did Blinken. I mean, my God. So did the New York Times, so did CNN, so did the BBC. Everyone was talking about the Ukraine counteroffensive. Everybody. They were saying in which direction. They were saying how many soldiers, how many, how many tanks, how they're, how they're going to move towards that direction, how many missiles, how many guns. How much food they're going to bring with them. Uh, how many vehicles are going to be going in that direction. I mean, it was, it was nonstop for like six months talking about the counteroffensive. <laughs> I mean, they had maps with the, 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 the lines, the exact direction of, uh, of going from, from, from the south to the Sea of Azov. Like the exact line saying this is, this is going to be the spring counteroffensive, everybody. And these were posted on like. Washington Post on the Washington Post or the New York Times. So I wonder how Russia knew. <laughs> we all knew Alensky. Everybody knew. <laughs> My God. Anyway, Alensky says, you know, spies. Spies in his military. That's how they knew. Huh, Alensky then said that Ukraine, again, he said this again, that Ukraine is going to be uh, starting up another counteroffensive in 2025. He is saying it now pretty much every day. Ukraine is going to be launching a counteroffensive in 2025. My God, Alensky, <laughs> you're announcing it again. You're telegraphing all your freaking moves. How are you going to launch a counteroffensive? How? How are you going to do this? You have no weapons. You have no, 
no military or barely you barely have a military left how are you going to launch you have no air defense you're you're 50 times weaker today than you were last year when you launched your counteroffensive so how are you going to launch a counteroffensive in 2025 it's raining it's raining wow so, no it's sunny it's raining oh boy yeah all right so uh yeah that's uh that's Zelensky. he said that ukraine is going to launch a 2025 summer summer spring fall i don't know offensive but uh the conditions are as i noted in previous videos that uh Alensky has to get the 61 billion if he doesn't get the 61 billion no counteroffensive. It, no 61 billion no counteroffensive. give me 61 billion I buy a couple of homes and I also give you counteroffensive. I think this good deal. This very good deal, huh? Good deal. <laughs> yeah, Alensky, Alensky, Alensky. So yeah, he said that the other day. What else did uh, Alensky say? Oh, Alensky was, was talking about how the most important thing that Ukraine must accomplish, the absolutely most important thing for Ukraine to accomplish is to destroy the Crimea Bridge. They have to destroy the Crimea Bridge. There is nothing more important than the destruction of the bridge, according to Alensky. Nothing more important. Of course, the Russians, they, they jumped on these, these comments from Alensky and the the uh, putin administration they said there you go uh, he's talking about uh, terrorist acts right because everyone knows that the crimea bridge is is civilian infrastructure even budanov even budanov a couple of weeks ago said that russia they've got the the railroad now that uh, that they've completed which delivers all of the the military uh resources to the front line and the Crimea bridge serves zero, zero military strategic uh, value. That's what Budanov said two weeks ago. That's what he said in an interview. And, and now you have Alensky saying that there's nothing more important than destroying the Kerch bridge, which is, even according to Budanov, a civilian target. So the Russians are basically saying Alensky, he is talking about terrorist acts. But that is what Alensky said. He just cannot keep his, his mouth shut. But, you know, he's, he's scared. He's scared and he is in an absolute panic because everything is crumbling around him. And that brings us to the new mobilization law, which passed the Ukraine parliament Yesterday, the interesting part about the vote that took place in the parliament, from what I understand, seeing various uh, videos from the parliament session, is that even though you have something like 300 or 400 members of parliament, only 44 or 45, 46 members of the parliament actually showed up to vote in person. Everybody else was a no-show. They voted for the mobilization law, but they didn't turn up at the parliament. And there is, there is a lot of talk that a lot of the MPs in Ukraine are desperately trying to find a way out of Ukraine because they know that the collapse is coming and they're just uh, thinking about, about taking all of their, their riches that they've accumulated over the many years and getting the getting the you know what out of dodge so the mobilization law the mobilization law is a terrible grim very grim very depressing law that was passed by the parliament and by the alensky regime the the mobilization law, it is 
saying? It's okay. Speak. I'm just, I'm just doing a video. <laughs> the, uh, the mobilization law, it is saying that 25-year-olds can now, will now be drafted. That's, that's the, the, the basic part of the mobilization law. 25-year-olds will, will be drafted from 27 to 25. But, but the sinister part of this law is that 18 to 60-year-olds need to register in a database for military service. And Ukrainians in Europe, Ukrainians outside of Ukraine, but mostly in Europe, they will need to, uh, to register in a military database. If they don't register in a military database, then they will be denied uh, embassy, consular services, which pretty much means they will be persona non grata. They won't, they won't exist. They won't have an embassy to go to. So that's, that's pretty, pretty sinister. 18 to 60 year olds, wherever you are, if you have a Ukraine passport, if you're a Ukraine citizen, you have to register in the military database and, and the mobilization law also, also removes the, the provision of demobilization. Demobilization was part of the law and it was removed which would have set a three-year limit on how long soldiers serve in the conflict. Now the law is saying that was removed. That part was removed. And now the law is saying that once you're in the military and you're fighting, you are fighting indefinitely. A lot of people are very angry in Ukraine, from what I understand, are very angry about this mobilization law. Even the New York Times talked about this mobilization law, and the New York Times said that the new mobilization will erase a whole generation of Ukrainians because it's going to mobilize the 18 to 25-year-olds. Year you're not talking about a, a very large demographic to begin with, but you're talking about the, the demographic that... that uh, that is now at risk of, of just vanishing, of vanishing. No, no families, no, uh, no children, the men being sent to, to the front lines to be annihilated. Even the New York Times said this, that, uh, that this law is going to erase a whole generation. Oh boy. All because Alensky has to keep the conflict going. Alensky and, and the neocons and all of these guys and the, and the EU globalist class because they have to keep this conflict going. They have to try to keep this conflict going. They're, they're willing to sacrifice an entire generation. Anyway, the Biden White House, they are talking about Ukraine sunk cost, the sunk cost of Ukraine. Pentagon warns U.S. could miss Ukraine payoff. Kiev urgently needs more aid to prevent Russian success. U.S. military officials have claimed Washington must double down on funding Kiev's war effort against Moscow to ensure that billions of dollars in previous investments do not go to waste. The Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, Celeste Wallander, has claimed, what we need right now to prevent Russian success in Ukrainian defeat is passage of the supplemental, she said, urging Congress to approve President Biden's aid package, which would earmark another $60 billion for Ukraine. And none of that work that we've done for two years in investing in Ukraine's future will pay off unless we get them through the next few months. The sunk cost, sunk cost fallacy have to get 60 billion to Project Ukraine because we've already invested hundreds and hundreds of billion into Project Ukraine, maybe even a trillion over the last decades into Project Ukraine. And we have to keep this thing going. Otherwise, all that money 
went towards nothing. The sunk cost fallacy. The Biden White House is, is bogged down in Ukraine. They are boxed in and bogged down in Ukraine. Uh, Trump, by the way, he said that he has no intention of going to Ukraine. I talked about this in my video yesterday. Alensky said that he is trying to get Trump to Kiev in order to unleash the Alensky curse on Trump. And uh, the Trump campaign team, they said, nope, we have absolutely no interest in going to Kiev to meet with Alensky. So how are we doing on time here? So let's, uh, hmm, let's see, should I do another story? Let's do, let's do Cloud Worlds. Let's do some Cloud Worlds and we'll wrap the video up. So I don't know if, uh, if you guys have seen the full video of uh, Vauban and Lexus prank calling the president of the Olympic Committee of the IOC, Mr. Thomas Bach. But uh, if you haven't seen it, oh, go see it. <laughs> go see it. It is on Rumble. And it's about, I want to say, 30 minutes long. And it's not only the, the Olympic president that, uh, that is in this prank call. It's also the vice president of the EU Commission, Margaritis Shinas. So it's, it's, the, it's the guy second to Ursula. I believe he's second to Ursula. He's at this meeting. It's a Zoom call. He's there on this Zoom call. The IOC president, Thomas Bach, is at this Zoom call. And then you have uh, either Vovan or Lex. I don't know which one of the two it is. But he's pretending to be the president of the African Council or something like that. And man, is it funny. I mean, it is funny. There's a, there's, there's a one point in the video towards the end where, uh, where either Vovan or Lexis, whoever it is, uh, the, the president of the African Council, right? Uh, Thomas Bach and, uh, and the, the EU guy, they believe this is really the president of the African Council that they're talking to. And, and you know, they're talking about ways to, to derail the friendship games. How do we derail the friendship games? How do we get the African nations to not participate in the friendship games? You know, Russia bad, uh, Alensky good, EU good, right? They're talking all this stuff during the, during the video. And towards the end, the president of the, the pretend, the make-believe president of the African Council goes, before, before we go, before we end this, this call, uh, I, need you, I need you both to, to say a prayer to, to the saints, Saints of my country. Today is a, is a holiday, he says, and, and we're honoring the two saints of my country, Saint Vovan and Saint Lexis. So let's, let's put our hand right here, he says. <laughs> he says, let's put our hand right here and uh, let's say this prayer to Saint Vovan and Saint Lexis. And he comes up with this ridiculous prayer. And uh, Thomas Bach, the, <laughs> the Olympic president and the EU, like vice president, they join uh, Vovan or Lexis in this, in this ridiculous prayer to Saint Vovan and Lexis. Anyway, just, just go see the video. It's on Rumble. If you type in Vovan and Lexis, you'll see the, the prank call. It's, it's beyond funny. <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if, if you ever had any doubts about the intelligence of, of the globalist uh, class, the globalist elite, if you ever, if you ever thought... You know, are, are they really that incompetent? Are they really, are they really that, that, you know, <laughs> really, they no, can't be. They, they must have some smarts. They must have some brains in order to, to get to the positions that, that they are in. <laughs> Watch this video. It will answer all your, all your questions. <laughs> Uh, I just think about it. I'm laughing. It's it's a crazy video, man. Oh boy. So uh, Samantha Power, she posted this tweet on the 11th of April, 2024. I believe she was uh, testifying, giving a statement to Congress as well. Samantha Power of the Obama administration. She's now in charge of U.S. aid, and she posted this on Twitter X. And she also said, said this to Congress, Putin is losing ground 
in the fight to destroy Ukraine's economy. In fact, Ukraine's economy is on track to grow 5% this year. Critical support from the U.S. and other allies has bolstered the Ukrainian resilience and helped them get on the path to self-sufficiency. <laughs> 5% growth, <laughs> really? Oh my God. <laughs> I can't think of a better return on an investment, not only because the economy has not collapsed and indeed will grow by 5% this year, not only because Ukraine is now back to feeding the world despite Putin's attempts to destroy Black Sea port exports and, and agricultural land and, and agricultural equipment, uh, and that that has brought down global food prices, including food prices here in the United States, surely. Its tech sector grew by 5% in the first year after Putin invaded Ukraine. Its young people determined, again, to invent, and, and USAID facilitating those partnerships, trade fairs, job fairs, making those export linkages. That is what the supplemental also funds. It, yes, it's humanitarian assistance. Yes, it's ammunition uh, for Ukraine but it is development, it is economic development that is going to put Ukraine in an incredibly strong position to be the, the, a member of Europe uh, and a member of democratic civilization that contributes and gives back. I want, I, I, I want to smoke what she's smoking. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, Ukraine is the economy, 5% growth. <laughs> sure. Sure. Oh, boy. So that's, uh, that's Samantha Power. <sighs> oh, boy. All right, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. Pick up some limited edition merchandise. Link is in the description box. Down below. <laughs>